Listen, it's this great to be here. We've been working out there in summers, you know, just a few, um, just a month at a time, just, you know, summer one. So we don't get out um, there as much as we would like. And, uh, you know, we don't get to meet everyone. So I'm glad that we finally could, like, get together. Our research is kind of multi-pronged, but we're, we're really interested in uh, these Pueblos. But, you know, there's been people, let me see if I can use, there have been people here for about 12,000 years out there running around. So it, it's not a, it's not, this is the end of the whole sequence in some sense. Um, just to put this in perspective culturally, in the Southwest, you have sort of three root cultures um, that are sort of associated with the beginning of agriculture or farming. Before that, they're just sort of generically hunters and gatherers of different times. And so when you start saying Hokam or Mugion or Anasazi, you're talking about people who are farming corn, beans, and squash. And they initially, for thousands of years, live in sort of subterranean pit houses. And eventually they switch to surface ruins, depend, uh, pueblos. Uh, the Anasazi first at about 750 AD, the Hohokam and the Magyon around 1000 AD. And so the, the actual living in the Pueblo is a life way, is a relatively recent and short-lived uh, sort of experiment in some sense. I mean, it's about 400 years. The, in the, both of these two regions at 1450, that life way ends, and people revert back to a, a, a sort of more general dependence on partially wild and partially domestic crops, living in small settlements. And we would argue that that was a result of the Little Ice Age. Just to put this in perspective, the late Pueblos here are um, in the Horn, oh, I should go back, sorry. You can, div you can divide the, well, maybe I can't. You can divide the Magyon into Hornada and Membris, and our site's right there in the middle on the boundary. And sometimes it looks more <laughs> like the Membris branch, sometimes it looks more like the Hornada branch, depending on the, the, uh, what you're looking at. So the, the ceramics look very Hornada. The architecture seems to look to me more like the Membris area. Um, and it has other potentials like irrigation which is not very Hornada-ish. So here's some of the sites from the late period. And you can see there's some here on the, I could actually use this, on the, uh, east, on the flanks here of the mountains. There's a bunch over here in the, in the Tularosa Basin. Most of the research that has ever been done in this area has been down on Fort Bliss only because they had the money and they hired the people to do it. And so we have a kind of a skewed view of the history of this Pueblo time period based on what you find there. More recently, White Sands has started sponsoring a lot of more contract work, and it's totally changing how we see this time period. Um, and then we've been you know, following up on Mead Kimmer's work, who was out uh, volunteering and doing work out here. So we've been starting to work in this area. Um, our question is, is sort of multifaceted. I might, by training, I'm, I'm a specialist in the archaeology of ritual and religion. I actually teach courses on witchcraft and all sorts of magic and all kinds of interesting things. But in addition to that, and to complement that, of course, we're also interested in how people react to climate change, particularly in the sort of context of climate change today. Uh, and what you see is in this Pueblo period, it begins in a time of really good climate, relatively speaking, in the southwest. Around 1000 AD, you have a very warm and wet period. You know, it's always, this is the southwest, so it's not always wet. But relatively speaking, it's pretty good. Then you have a terrible time in the 1200s. And then it sort of gets better again in the 1300s. And so, these people in these pueblos, the whole time practically, they were dealing with this problem. And as part of that, you see changes in the way they organize themselves. You see new religious movements rise and fall. So that's you know, where I, one of the reasons I got interested in it. You know, and that's unfortunately 
or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, I think is going to be the future that we're going to be facing. As the climate gets worse, most societies of the world, they don't see, the, see that process as a meteorological one. Most people sort of personify nature, and they see droughts as sort of deities or the causes of deities. Their ancestors are unhappy, this kind of thing, and they react to it. And that's going to happen as well in the modern world. And sometimes they react quite violently, and that's where the witchcraft persecution kinds of things come in. Hopefully, we won't have that too much out here that way, but we'll see. So just to sort of give you the, the background, I'm, some of you are probably familiar with Christina Mayer's work on the tree ring <coughs> studies. And this, I love, this is a, an earlier one that he did up in Grant's area, then he's got another one that was done in the southern part of the this region. Both of them are quite comparable in terms of what we find and complement earlier studies. But what I like about his work is that he you know, goes ahead and tries to apply it to some of the culture areas. And what you'll see here is these are the phases or sort of the subcultures that we talk about for the, for the Pueblo times around here. So the earliest one is 1000 to 1150. Then you have this one from 1150 to 1300, and then another one, 13 to 1450. And you can sort of see that it's on these nice humps that you have these cultures rising. So they're, they correlate pretty well with precipitation. If you go back in time, it doesn't correlate as well. And in part, it's because as the population is increasing and people are becoming more sort of tied to places, they're less flexible. So when you do have climatic shifts, they can't as easily just abandon the farm for a couple of years and go live off agave hearts or something, because there's other people doing the same thing in the same area. So earlier in time, people are, have more flexibility when they're dealing with, say, this kind of drought back here or, or nice rainfall. But as, it, as you go through time, it becomes more and more precise to the point that we lose pueblos right here. The only pueblos that make it are up north. And everywhere else, and then over in Arizona, this does it in. At least that's our interpretation. And to complement that, you also have temperature. And these, admittedly, we could argue, people argue all the time, but this is how I sort of break up the, the temperature regimes. Like I see, this is the early medieval warm period. And it sort of lasts a little longer than the actual phase here. But it goes to, you know, into the about 1200, about, you know. And then you've got a cold period, then a warm period. So I call that sort of a transitional. And then you've got this long period of cold that would be the little ice age. Once again, it's that same exact time. There was the double whammy, 1450, that it gets really cold and dry. And that's, I think, why the, they have so much trouble with the, the agriculture. And even this 1200s time is, is really bad. Like, technically, uh, this is a foreshadowing. We don't know any sites in the 1200s out there on the range, particularly at Cottonwood. But it's a little difficult to identify them sometimes because the ceramics aren't that distinctive. There's only a few things that you can use. So unless you actually dig them, and date them with some radiocarbon or something like that. It's, you're not sure, because they'll look like, they'll look similar to the later ones. So that's one of our, our interests. But once again, I think it's amazing how relatively well these, these regimes correlate with the, with the phases. And these phases were defined long ago, independent of this. So it's kind of cool. So when you look at the droughts, the drought that ends the, uh, that first phase is a really bad one. And, and I don't have, I didn't put it on here, but it's particularly bad throughout the entire Southwest because right before it, the 20 years before, it was one of the wettest periods that ever existed in the Southwest. So you have like Chaco Canyon, if you guys have ever been up there. All of that is going great guns. All the big sites in the Phoenix Valley are doing great. All the members, Pueblos, this is the same time as members Pueblos, if you're familiar with them. They're all flourishing, and then boom, they totally overshoot you know, the carrying capacity when everything 
collapses. And so there's a huge abandonment and reorganization of the entire Southwest. It's not, and we have it in our little corner here, but it also happens through everywhere. And that's when all the cliff dwellings up north are founded and people start, um, like Mesa Verde, they move there. They abandon Chaco. They change their whole architecture and, and other things in the whole comp. So it's, it's a, a time of radical change. And then you have another one that ends the 1200s. And in this drought, the Four Corners is abandoned. And you've probably heard about that. So Mesa have already, those same places they moved to, they leave them. They're all gone. And they have a massive change here, but when it recovers, we have the, the founding of the El Paso phase and all the Pueblos down here. So it's this alternation between like a, you know, good times, then the droughts, and then things get better and you sort of reorganize and you have a whole new set. And then this is the final one here. So moving on, Cottonwood Spring Pueblo is actually six or five Pueblo, six sites. So it's not actually one Pueblo. And even within those, there's, it depends on how you count them. This was an early map done in the 80s. Uh, the one that's near the spring where we worked a lot is this area A. You cross the little wash there and there's a hill and there's a tiny Pueblo made out of stone, which is unusual because most of them are adobe on top. There's kind of a shrine or something on this little hill here. Both, all of this is covered with rock art. And then you cross this wash and you're on this sort of just out here in the sand dunes and there's multiple sort of sites. There's one here that Kristen is actually writing the NSF improvement grant to, to work on for her dissertation. We have this site here, which is our, our site that's actually from the early time, the members time, the 11, 10 hundreds. And then finally, another one here. And originally there was a guy named Yo, who was an engineer who sort of mapped these. And this one is about 200 meters long, this room block that he shows. It's not visible now, but Mead, Kimmer, and others have actually sort of found in some of the aerials some of these pictures, and we've sort of worked on a, one that I'll show you out here. So it should be Cottonwood Spring Pueblos, I guess, but it's a community. This is what we call aggregation. So in the end of the 1200s, people all moved into this area and as a community started building this big sort of settlement. All right? And so there's only a couple other ones like it in this region. And here's just, a, just to give you some sense of the topo and relief. I don't know. Is this taboo for like, people seeing? Like, no looters allowed. Like, don't, don't figure out where this is. Um, anyway, so you know, they've been named A, B, C, and D. Um, here's the, here's like sort of the early vision of the members. And if you're not familiar with it, it's the black and white pottery. It's quite um, distinctive and very popular. And this is Hattie Cosgrove, I think digging there. She's a famous archeologist. And you can see that Cottonwood is kind of outside the boundary, but close to what they consider part of it. And this is where things are starting to change. Because historically, this is where all the famous member sites are. And, and just to give you some context, and I think you guys can relate to this since you work at JER, right? Like, why do you think all the Pueblos are here and they're not documented, the ones down here very much, even though they drew a line around it? Any guesses? Why would you want to work here and not here? It's in the shade. It's, in the, it's cold. Exactly. This is where the academics go, like with their field schools. You got water, you can stick your feet in the river. You know, no one wants to come out here, but there's huge Pueblos out here all the way down into Chihuahua. I saw one in the dump at Hanos that was enormous, like a member of site down there. So it's really a much, and they, you know, they sort of recognize that, but they always talk about this as the heartland. And I think that's because this is where they work. They're wimpy. <laughs> this is a more closer to reality. Uh, there's, a, there's a great archeologist out of UNM and then Colada, who's been doing a lot of research over on the, mostly on Wismer, but he's sort of been making maps and sort of trying to see how things really look. And what you see is here's Cottonwood here, I guess. And 
and these are just based on surface counts. So I think this dot is going to get bigger through time as we sort of start exploring it more. But you have a lot of big member sites that are way over here. And in the old days, they would say, well, they're not members because they don't have Pueblos. They just have pit houses still. But I'm pretty sure that this is, is a Pueblo right here out there in Cottonwood. It's a, it looks exactly the same on the surface as all the other Adobe Pueblos do that are later. So that's one of the things that we want to test. But there's clearly a lot of members action over here from this early Doniana time period. And it makes sense. There, this was the best time in the Southwest. You have Anasazi people on the Virgin River over in Nevada at this time. And they totally retreat after this. But it's a good time to be a farmer in the Southwest. And he even has suggested some ways of, and I'd love to hear what you guys think, like how people might be sort of trans crossing the mountains if they had to instead of going through St. Augustine Pass. So he, these are some suggested routes that he has from Cottonwood across and down over here into Lake Lucero through San Andreas Canyon. I've never done it myself, so I have no idea how that would work. Because anyone, I know the road is, comes over here somewhere, doesn't it? Where's the road? Been there, done that on the road? Was it, a, was it exciting? <laughs> but, so this is what it kind of looks like on the surface, as you guys know. And environmentally, it's much more difficult around here. You don't always see the ruins, like if you're in other parts of the Southwest, you know, because they're buried by the dunes and things. But you can tell by based on the, all the rocks and other detritus that's melted out of the adobe walls or left over from floors that got washed by sort of erosion. Primarily, you're looking for the ceramics, because these people all used lots of ceramics, and these black and white ones are a dead giveaway. Now, there are some black and white ceramics from later in time. But in general, they're, these are very distinctive if you know what you're looking for. So we know that that one area is earlier. Um, we don't really know what's going on, though, very well in the 1200s. I mean, the entire century is terrible, just below average. And then you ha it sort of ends with a really bad drought. Um, so, and, and the ceramics, after 1150, when they stop making, they, like, that's another interesting thing. Once like, that big drought hits, people stop making the black and white pottery. And there's no reason that they had to stop. But we would argue that they, the most material cultures kind of considered animate by native cultures. And so when you're having a problem, like environmental problem, they usually blame it on spiritual forces and such. And that includes architecture. That includes objects. Because all of those things are used in their ceremonies. And so if the ceremonies aren't working, then when you change the ceremony, you change the materials too. So they start new pottery, new forms of architecture, new all sorts of things. That's one of the reasons why they change, because there's no reason to change. They can still make that black and white, but they don't want to. They don't like it. Anyway, here's like the 1300s. If you look in this sort of comparative framework, these are other contemporary Pueblos from the 1300s. Most of them are relatively small. Now, most of these are also on Fort Bliss. You know, so of the ones that we know that are large, these medium-sized ones are closer to Almogordo. Fleck Draw, Indian Tank, which is also on that same sort of drainage, are huge. And then this is just Cottonwood Area A, just that one of the four Pueblos. And it's probably the biggest compared to these. It's, I mean, this is more or less the same scale. I was trying to get them in scale. So, what you can tell is not only is there an aggregation in the cottonwood and other drainages of the San Andres, but there are huge amounts of people coming in. And so it seems like at least after that 1200s, when things get better, when they come together, they're, they're cooperating. And probably multi-ethnic groups. This is something that we're going to investigate. Like They're not all the same people. So we want to see the variability in some of the actual Pueblos. And that would be sort of one of our long-term research things. So just to give you a sense of some of the stuff that we see at A, this is some small excavations that we've done 
um, compared to the whole site. And those of you who have been out there, you know, you walk up the wash here, and then you sort of enter right here. And there's been some disturbance a while ago, in the 60s, I think, of bulldozers and such. But there's still tons of room blocks and things if you can hack down the, the mesquite and all the rest of it. So you get things like this, which is sort of like we cleared an area of like maybe you know, 15 rooms. This is um, down here in the sort of middle. Let's see if I can get this. This is this room right here. You can see that it's only half of the room is there. And that's because this bulldozer came through like this. But we got a tree ring date off of the floor of that half room. A little tiny nurdle from a, a roofing beam. And it was 1366 VV. And those of you who are not familiar with what that means is they don't have the exact outside ring, which is what you need to know for the exact date. But when they say VV, based on their experience and knowledge of things beyond my knowledge, they say you're close to the outside ring. Yes, sir. How, how big are those rooms? You know, they're, they vary, but they're around four, three and a half meters to four meters on the side. Yeah, so they're, they're relatively large. One story, as far as we can tell. They're all burnt. That's hence the, the fires. You know? That's the thing that we find consistently at this site and at the other sites that we've tested so far. And generally, throughout the Southwest, that's a very common pattern. And so the first thing you're probably thinking about is, oh, they were attacked, and it was a big battle. And some archaeologists will actually say that. But based on the stratigraphy that we encounter, the rooms are typically cleaned out beforehand. Oftentimes, they'll seal up the features, like the hearth will be covered over and any sort of other thing. A few things are placed in there. And I have a whole lecture about this, but I don't want to go too far into it. But what we would argue is they did this on purpose. This is how they abandon. They sort of close it down and they burn it themselves. So sort of imagine metaphorically, this is kind of like they're burying the site. And it's like a funeral. They're cremating it. Uh, and if you look at the many sites, you can sort of tell stratigraphically, it doesn't look like they, it's not Pompeii, right, where all the stuff is in there and the volcanoes coming, the gases are getting them or whatever in the ash. No, it's purposely planned and organized in the way they destroy it. Anyway, so we got a, it's, it shows that it's later 1300s. And there is in the uh, actual blip in the, in the tree rings anyway that shows that there was a nice wet period after 1350. So it probably is part of that. So it's, it's not even early 1300s. This is just to give you an example of some of the complexity that you see out there. Like, it's a mess, right? We clear off all the bushes, chop them down. You got walls going like this, walls going like this. Walls going like this. And then post holes, post holes, all kinds of stuff. And you're like, what am I going to do with that? You know, and you start digging and trying to keep track of it. And you, they have cimientos, these kind of stone rebar that you would put inside the adobe to sort of anchor things, keep it upright. And that's something that we don't see at the other pueblos. That's something that this pueblo has. So it's not a sort of a universal thing. It's an architectural difference. But just to give you a sense of what you were just looking at, you got different rooms constructed at different times at this site. This thing that goes across the top like that is the last thing. So here's the kind of sequence. First, you start with these rooms here. And we now know, and I didn't, couldn't find this slide, but these are all in place over one large room. So right here. And the amount of sort of ritual stuff that we find in here suggests that when they abandoned these rooms later, they were still remembering that earlier uh, room because the relative amounts of stuff is just too much for these rooms, unless there's some reason. But anyway, that's another story. So after that, then you build these other rooms like this. And you can see they're butted on. And then finally, near the end, they put this thing. We have no idea what this is. I've never seen th something like that in any Hornada site, or really any site around the Southwest. Mm -hmm. This big old adobe wall that went in a circle like that across everything. And like there was a big debate, like that's a game trail, you know? And 
We're like, well, yeah, I can sort of see it, but it's got post holes running along it, you know, so that doesn't work. Like, so I don't know if, if it's historic or what it is, but we don't really have a lot of historic stuff. The problem is it's been eroded, right? So the floor is gone. And in fact, some of the floors of these were barely left intact. And everything's sort of washing down the hill where the bulldozer came through. So it's, it's a tease. But it does give you a sense that at least at this site, you had a long occupation, at least a lot of remodeling, rebuilding, changing things, which sort of looks to me like it's, it was there probably first before the others. And it kind of makes sense because it's closest to the spring. Now, if we move down into the flat area where Kristen was working this summer, this is her crew. You can see how they're, this is what it kind of looks like when you clear off the sand dunes and bushes and things. The walls sort of start to appear really nicely. In fact, I was so jealous, I didn't want to work down there ever. I said, oh, let's start at that A one because it looks like a real Pueblo. You know, it, I could see rocks and walls and things kind of protruding out. And down here, all you saw was sand dunes. And it just looked like a nightmare. But all she did was take a broom and this, like, brush it, and this just appeared. Uh, it was the easiest thing I'd ever seen, and I felt like so silly, you know. Now, interestingly, though, it's not very deep. And you don't have a lot of remodeling. You don't have cimientos. The room sizes are different. So it really is suggestive of, like, you know, people coming in, building something new, and not necessarily even being the same people. Now, it's really preliminary now. So we're going to look at the kinds of uh, ceramics and other trade materials and such and see if there is something more distinctive going on there. But that's our operating hypothesis, that you have different groups of people from, you know, probably not super far away, but somewhere maybe, you know, in southern New Mexico area moving in here. Um, so some of the subsistence, oh, my corn picture didn't appear. That's weird. Imagine a burned corn cob right here <laughs> from our site. <laughs> you know, the thing about the burning that's kind of counterintuitive, even though everything is burned, because it's rendered inert as charcoal, it doesn't decay. And so we do have relatively good preservation of macrobotanical remains. The problem is, you know, that's a real expertise to be able to identify all the macrobots. And then on top of that, like some of you probably are macrobot specialists, but maybe not with burned ones from a thousand years ago, right? But please, it'd be a great thing to develop a skill, you know? Because we need your help. These are, these are actually, oh, there it is. I just wasn't being patient, I guess. This is, these are actually not from the site, but I couldn't find the, 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 the one picture of a squash seed that we do have that looks just like these Hopi. These are Hopi beans and Hopi seeds from the 30s that I found online. And I was going to pretend like we found them, but <laughs> I'm being good. Anyways, you see, but this is part of the burned roofing. So these are the kind of things that, you know, you could do carbon dating on. If you have a right piece, you could do some uh, tree ring dating as well. And then, you know, the corn is good because it's, a, it's an annual. Um, one of the things that we've just started investigating and we're really excited about is a couple guys who are working over in Tularosa Basin at a site called Creekside have identified a bunch of canals from like the 600s in this pit house village. And they came over and looked around and said, you know, this is what, whoops, this game trail here is kind of looks like topographic context and the sort of look of, of what we would call a runoff ditch, where they're capturing waters that runs down the slopes of the sort of Bajada area there, and then they just channel it down towards fields. So it's not like spring fed, but it is sort of runoff fed. And of course, it, as it fills in, then it could, you know, the game could start using it as a trail. So, which then makes it look more or less like a canal, depending on your perspective. You get, you know, stone alignments as well. So it's sort of function as check dams to keep the erosion down and maybe capture and slow down the water. Um, over in Arizona, you'd, the native peoples would do that with brush even and just sort of temporary things, act chin farming it's called. And so that's something that we need to sort of document as well in more detail. Um, 
In terms of things like the social ties that create the cooperative activities that seem to characterize this late time, we're looking at all the various <coughs> objects that we find, some for more economics, some for just ritual interesting things. Like, for example, these are shells that we found that seem to be from turkeys. And while you would think, oh, they just eat the turkeys, but really it's not that common as you would think to eat turkeys, but it's real common to raise turkeys and then trade their feathers around. Because the feathers are quite valuable for various Native American rituals and things. This is a gastrolith. Kristen found that, I think, didn't you? She's very proud of that. A little dinosaur, stone or something. A lot of trade in shell, um, you know, for decorative and sort of costuming, this kind of thing. We find these with some frequency, spindle whorls. And the thing that you would use them for would be to make yarn, typically out of cotton. Cotton is king in the Southwest in the 1300s. It's the major sort of gold for people. Textiles are far more important than actual precious metals in many cultures of the world. And we know historically, based on Spanish accounts, that people are trading cotton blankets, clothing, all over the Southwest. The thing is, we, don't, we haven't done our macrobots, and I haven't personally seen any seeds or sticks of cotton, but we find the tools for processing the stuff. And then, of course, people are trading a lot of obsidian. So we get stuff from different places, from the West Coast, from the Gila River. A lot of our obsidian comes from there. Some of it from up north, some of it local, but most of it from the sources on the Gila River. Um, and so just to give you an example, this is the kind of feathers you know, that you would use it in a headdress. This is a Zuni headdress. This is a Hopi guy spinning you know, cotton with that same spindle whirl on the stick there. I don't know, has anyone ever spun cotton? Yeah? Sean, you're an expert spinner? Uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's cool. What's the potential? I don't know. Could they grow cotton out there? What do you guys think? JER people? Yeah. It seems like they could, right? If they could grow, if we could find the cotton in the floats, that would be awesome. And then, of course, there's the ceramics that everyone knows and loves. The most common is what we call El Paso polychrome. And it's quite distinctive if you ever see it because it has lots of little white rocks that are sort of this granitic material that's coming out of the Franklin Mountains. They use that for temper. It's got a sort of a brown bottom usually that's unpainted with black and red paint on the top. That's our most local. But even still, the ceramics that we have of that all seem to be made in the El Paso area. So they're bringing even that up. In fact, so far, and we've only done preliminary analysis, all of the ceramics that we have are not made at Cottonwood. They're all traded there, which sort of drives me crazy because then I don't know what they're giving back, like besides maybe some cotton or feathers, but that doesn't seem like enough to me. We got this Tularosa black and white. This is the one black and white pottery that continues on after the 1100s. And it's made up, in this particular case, it's made up in, in the other side of the Sacramentos on the sort of valleys going down as you drive from Ruidoso down up towards uh, Roswell area. Um, rather than, there's another source which is in the Salinas Pueblos to the north, but this doesn't source to that. And then this is a really interesting type. It's a black, white, and red type called Salado. And there's multiple types within that, that name. Most of this is coming from the west, where the same place that the obsidian comes from. So the people who control the obsidian seem to be the people making this pottery. And then, of course, this is from Chihuahua. This is a Ramos polychrome. Uh, it's beautiful, high-fired stuff. We don't have a lot of it, but we have a good amount. We have an extra lot of this stuff, more than your typical Jornada Pueblo has, and that's why that's kind of interesting. And this pottery itself has been a subject of lots of study because it's usually in these big bowls and it has a lot of abstract imagery, but a lot of that imagery looks like serpent heads. And so it seems to be a feasting ware that would accompany these people. In the, within the bigger story, it's created when all the people leave the Four Corners region, 
particularly in northern Arizona, and they come south, bringing their pottery technology with them. They mix with the local people, and the outcome is this style pottery, which has attributes of northern Arizona, technologically mixed with Mogollon stuff. So it's kind of cool. And then finally, at the same time that all of this is going on, you have the spread of new sort of religious imagery. And that's why we have this horned serpent at the site. This is the only horned serpent at Cottonwood. It's up on a rock right overlooking the Pueblo. We have other images up there. And this is very interesting because when you see faces, that's quite distinctive. And as well as these sort of paw prints and roadrunner footprints. It's part of this sort of larger horned serpent cult that spreads across the Southwest at different times. It sort of ebbs and flows. Like in the earlier 1100s, it was quite popular. 1200s, it sort of is unpopular, then it comes back in the 1300s. And you know, it's obviously got connections farther south in Mexico with Quetzalcoatl and other horned um, serpent beings. But it's its own distinctive thing, so I don't think it means that they, you know, the Toltecs were up here doing things per se. I think it's just an older mythological tradition that they both kind of share as Udo Aztecan peoples. And then finally, just some of this stuff continues on. I mean, so basically all of the Pueblo ceremony organization that you see in historic times is all sort of comes into being in the 1300s. And that's why it's such an important time. Um, and it's sort of a blessing curse thing about the religion. All the religions that we know of today, when you think of Pueblo religions, are created at this time of rapid climate change. Um, on the other hand, you know, that always scares me when you get new religions forming. You never know what's going to happen. Um, anyway, so just to sort of summarize the kinds of things we're, we're interested in studying for our NSF you know, that's coming up, there's so many things we could do, but what we really need is to get all the plants and identified. We need to document all the water technology that we can. Dave Rochelle, I think some of you guys know him, is, didn't, wasn't able to come today, but he's already been working on this and identified over in Goldenberg Draw, just on the just a mile south of Cottonwood, a nice set of strata where he thinks they have this exact time period from like 1,000 to 1,500. And you can see sort of wetter and dry periods. So we want to document those and date them. Because then we would have some, an extra addition to the tree rings. You know, we could say, look, locally, this is like a wet period or a dry period. It dates to X time. And you know, it relates to these pueblos coming together. We need to source all the ceramics, you know, neutron activate them, use the x-ray diffraction on the obsidian to pin that down, and then link those two together. And then finally, run all the dates that we can. You know, we're lucky to get tree rings when we can, but the problem is the trees aren't the best around here. There's a lot of complacent trees or trees that just don't work. Um, whereas if you're farther north, you know, they have a, every other room has 10 tree ring dates in it. But with Bayesian sort of manipulation of the tree rings, the archaeomagnetic dating that we can do, and other things, we can sort of narrow down those occupations and sort of, you know, put it all together. Because ultimately, you have to put everything in time. Otherwise, it all happens at the same time, and it's a mess. So anyway, thanks for letting us come, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. We love these creatures out there. Like, they're taking over, and I think that's great.